So my presentation today is going to be uh, on telescopes. Uh, basically, um, I'm uh, I'm into astrophotography these days, and uh, I do a little bit of uh, work for uh, the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program also, uh, taking my pictures there and using them for the presentations. So um, tonight I thought of giving a presentation to CAP on uh, basics of telescopes and uh, how we can implement telescopes in our uh, STEM program uh, under CAP as well. So that's some of the topics I'm going to cover today. Next slide, please. So uh, in the discussion summary today, I, I'm just going to talk about a little bit of history uh, with telescopes. Type of telescopes we have, uh, most of it we are concerned with uh, is today is optical, uh, although we do have other type of telescopes as well uh, that fit in the electromagnetic spectrum right from radio waves to gamma rays. And then I finally conclude by showing some of my work, whatever I have done uh, through whatever little I could do with my little telescope I have. So the simplest way uh, is to see the night sky is simply going out. Uh, it's pretty amazing uh, what you can learn just by looking at the sky, actually. Um, and of course, we are, uh, we are all doing this for thousands of years without any instrument. Um, the next best thing is a binocular, but these uh, don't give you the details that a telescope gives you. We can definitely do better. That's why we have telescopes. Um, next slide, please. So coming to the uh, history of uh, the telescopes, there is a widespread uh, um, rumor on the internet that Galileo has to do with the first telescope. That is completely not true. So the first person uh, to uh, invent the telescope is uh, a lesser known guy called Hans Lufoshi. He invented the refractor telescope in 1608. So uh, although we, uh, Galileo has done a lot of research subsequently, but Galileo is not the person who invented the telescope. However, um, Galileo did other things like he he actually proved that the geocentric system is not true at all because our ancients believe that earth is in the center of the solar system which is not true and he uh, did this by um, by taking images of jupiter and other uh, planetary systems uh, showing that the moons of those planets orbit I mean, uh, orbit the, the planets, not the sun or the earth. So that was like his, his uh, intention of showing that the heliocentric system is true and the geocentric system doesn't fit in. So as I said, uh, next slide, please. So what did Galileo notice? So he uh, noticed moons orbiting Jupiter. Uh, he noticed that the planet Venus has got faces just like our moon. He was also like uh, instrumental in observing craters on the moon for the first time and sunspots too. So uh, what was done by Galileo was bettered by Kepler. Next slide. Um, so Kepler, uh, instead of using Galileo's primitive setup, he improved the design a little bit and uh, he uh, gave two convex lenses. Um, so what it did was it improved the image quality, but the image was upside down. That's how uh, all telescopes still date work. Whatever you view was upside down and inverted. Next slide. So this slide talks about why can't you view all the objects in the night sky just with your naked eye? That's because the answer is simple. View, uh, if you see the uh, uh, your screen, that is your retina in your eye, uh, that's not sensitive enough to view uh, the uh, far away distance objects because you don't get the number of pixels for the image to form in your eye. So uh, that's why you are not able to see any, uh, uh, I mean, any detail of uh, planets or say something beyond. Uh, uh, you can see Jupiter with your naked eye, but you cannot see its moons without having a telescope, for example. But this, however, can be corrected by uh, using a, 
lens system or a mirror system um, by actually condensing the light. Um, you, it's basically like a bucket. So you have uh, um, the larger the size of the bucket, if you, if you have rain, uh, the more rain it can collect. It's the same way with light too. The same analogy can be applied there. So uh, the larger the diameter of the aperture, the uh, greater the uh, resolution of the uh, image is going to be. So the light gathering ability is uh, very important to a telescope. So which I'll talk about in the next slide. So uh, in the telescope, there are two important elements which uh, determine its light gathering ability. The objective lens is the first. That's we also call it the aperture. And then that uh, there is the eyepiece where we actually view uh, the uh, the image. So it can be our eye or it can be a sensor of a camera if in, in case of astrophotography. So as I already told, telescopes work by gathering light. Um, so when you see in this case, uh, instead of a bucket, I told the analogy, right? So uh, it's like it's an optical device like a lens or a mirror. So depending whether it's on a lens based system or a mirror based system, we the type of telescopes differ, which I will talk in the next slide. So the one thing one takeaway here is the bigger the objective, the more light it collects and the better the image quality will be. The first type of uh, telescope for gathering light like we use for objectives is uh, a lens based system. So we use a glass lens. There is this physics phenomenon called refraction. That's how it works. So basically think of a telescope uh, with either a mirror or a lens as a bucket with a funnel. So you're basically amplifying the uh, light at the end of the eyepiece. So you can either view it through lens or you can do it through mirrors. I will say it later uh, how that is possible. But that's the in essence, it's, it's a pretty simple device. So it's basically you go. Uh, th there is a lot of light that are scattered. Uh, so uh, we are we are using a funnel type structure and making making sure that the light comes to a single point. Next slide. Class, so what slide? You, what slide do you see that we're on right now? Um, I'm on slide number nine. Uh, how how does this apply to a telescope? Uh, no, I'm on lenses. Slide number eight, lenses. Oh, okay. So I just uh, went through quickly. I don't know whether things were lost in the process. Should I repeat something or? No, no, I think I just changed. I think I changed. I think I changed slides uh, at one point. I thought you told me to change slides and I guess I didn't mean to. OK, so you just finished sure. with lenses. You want to go right to now, how, Right now I'm going to slide number nine. And that's how does this apply to telescopes? Yeah, simple diagram of a telescope. Diagram of a simple telescope. OK, got it. I'm on yeah. That. So as you can see, what uh, I explained in the previous slide is the light is scattered all around from a light. Uh, when I say light, it's a light from an object, uh, any astronomical object, maybe a star, maybe a planet, maybe a, maybe a galaxy. Um, so the light distribution is pretty much parallel and scattered. So if you see the lens the on the right, the bigger lens, that's called the objective. Uh, what it does is actually uh, focuses all those light onto a single point and then through the eyepiece you again take it out and view the image on a uh, um, on a much concentrated scale. So we are talking about two forces uh, in play here. Uh, we talk about the focal length uh, of the objective and the focal length of the eyepiece and magnification is the ratio of the two. Slide number 10. Whenever we talk of telescope, we uh, we associate two general properties with it. Uh, the aperture, which we already discussed. The second part is uh, the magnification. Magnification is nothing but the ratio of the uh, um, of the telescope objective lens to the eyepiece um, focal length. So that gives you the magnification. So next slide. We're talking about aperture. Um, I already discussed this, but uh, we'll go in detail again. So which means um, 
I told you if you double the diameter of the collector, double the size of the aperture, you would collect four times more light. That's how it works. So um, suppose you have a, a diameter of an aperture 10 times wider, then you're collecting 100 times the light. So it's basically the square. You can see, uh, so even a millimeter increase in your diameter would actually uh, actually give you a better quality image. So clearly, uh, as telescopes get bigger, their ability to show us faint objects increases enormously. Uh, the telescope that collects light bounces it around and then channels it into the eye. That's the whole process. And uh, closer look at the eyepiece, which is slide number uh, 12. So if you, uh, we already discussed this, the image is going to be upside down, but uh, there are other ways to actually make it straight. Um, but we don't have to necessarily make it if you're just viewing it through a telescope. I mean, if you are doing an astrophotography project, then I would say you can use software to correct it. So next slide. So a little bit more on the magnification. Oh, I think the slides are out. I think the slides got out of order slightly. Okay. Yeah. So magnification. Okay. Yeah. So magnification is nothing but the uh, how how much you can enlarge the image. Again, magnification is not the most important thing for a telescope. The the most important uh, aspect of the telescope is the ability to gather light. Uh, in other words, aperture size. So if you focus too much on magnification, what happens is like you will get a bigger image, but you lose a lot of uh, detail in the image. Um, so it's always advisable that um, you handle the magnification within the focal uh, length capability of the telescope. That's what this slide says. So um, the next slide is talking about eyepiece. Um, on that slide. Yeah. So this is slide number 14. So the eyepiece is basically there to produce a sharp image. Um, you can adjust the focal length of the eyepiece. Um, you cannot adjust the focal length of the telescope, but you can adjust the focal length of the eyepiece um, because you have screws. I'll show you later where how it can be done to a level where uh, you can actually get a, a sharp image. Another thing we have to talk about here is some uh, a phenomenon called eye relief. You can actually see a sharp image, but you have to literally push your eye inside the, I mean, uh, closer to the eyepiece to get the image of the object. Uh, not only for viewing uh, through your eyes, if you use a camera sensor, you face the same difficulty as well. So uh, it's pretty difficult to view the image without actually holding the sensor right on top of the lens. So modern um, um, eyepieces have a lot of eye relief. Uh, uh, criteria and that's pretty important uh, based on your application. If you are going to do astrophotography, I would recommend uh, you get an eyepiece with uh, eye relief that is uh, significantly larger. The other important thing of an eyepiece is the field of view. Field of view is nothing but how much sky can you see uh, or how much area of the sky is covered under uh, one, uh, one view. So the greater the angle, um, the better the uh, better the quality of the image and the uh, and the uh, area of coverage is going to be. That's nothing but the field of view. So uh, eyepieces are uh, a science in itself. Choosing them for your application is really important. Um, you have uh, very cheap eyepieces which do the job, but uh, again, uh, to for specific applications, you have to use the eyepiece with the right field of view and the right eye relief. Jeff, do you have a question? Oh, I just want to comment that uh, most people who have telescopes have several eyepieces, so um, it's you're not limited to just one. They're easily uh, drop in and replace. So um, don't worry about the magnification at all. Get your telescope based on aperture, like Karash said. Sure, okay. I 100% uh, agree. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll probably show you the eyepieces I use for uh, my basic work, whatever I do. Uh, I can also show you my telescope at the end of the uh, end of the presentation. 
So okay. moving on to the next slide, which is slide number 15. Um, it's very important to use the right kind of filter as well. So this filter may actually sit right on top of the aperture or it might sit on the eyepiece. Depends. If you use a sun filter, for example, it sits on the aperture. Um, so basically, if you are viewing uh, viewing the sun, you better not view it without any protection. Then I, uh, it's going to create significant eye damage. So filter for viewing the sun is extremely, extremely important. Apart from that, that's the safety aspect. Now we are coming to uh, viewing uh, images that make sense to you. I mean, if you see Venus in the brightest uh, possible way in the morning at 6 a.m., it's going to be really bright. You're just going to see a halo white, uh, white kind of uh, spherical shape that's going to come up on the eyepiece and you will not make any sense of it at all. So you have to make sure that you reduce the amount of light or at least suppress some kind of wavelength in the light to get the view of the planet. So that's why we have different color filters. So we use the right, uh, right filter for the right application. Even for the moon, like if you're going to do some kind of activity with the moon on the full moon day, um, you are going to get excessive brightness. So you have to damp the brightness down uh, so that uh, your image is going to show that much more detail. So that's why we use filters. So um, the other thing I talked about was resolution. So resolution, it's very important that your telescope has the ability to see two separate objects that are located very close together. Uh, filters also enable you to enhance the uh, resolution. So that's another important aspect. Uh, I can, if you want an analogy for this, uh, what I could say is uh, if you see a car uh, in the night, like a mile away, uh, with its headlights on, you would see only a single headlight from probably a mile away. But if you if it's a few yards away from you, you can distinguish the light. I mean, from two different headlamps, right? So that's the analogy here. So again, what is important is this takes more meaning than magnification. So resolution is more useful than magnification when talking about telescopes. So magnification is probably the least important thing when it comes to telescopes. Okay, so now that we have we have discussed the uh, technicalities uh, and the science and the physics behind telescopes, so we will we will see the type of telescopes that are there in the market today. Predominantly, you either categorize them as refractor telescopes; they use uh, glass lenses, and uh, the other type, the more common one. Uh, we use, I say common, there is a reason why I say common, we'll, we'll see later. Uh, they use mirror instead of lenses. But then again, they, from the application point of view, they just exactly achieve the same thing, uh, but, uh, but in two different ways. Uh, you are still collecting light. Uh, it depends on how you're collecting light, whether you're collecting light through a mirror or a, or a lens. So slide number, slide number 17. Uh, Again, I'll go in detail about the refractor telescopes. So this is probably uh, the telescope we are familiar with. Uh, even in the movies and in the videos we see and the history we read about it, the image they reference is usually a refractor telescope. Even Galileo used a refractor telescope to see his observations. It's just a long tube made up of uh, metal, plastic or wood. Uh, you, have a, you have a combination lens at the front end forms the objective and then a secondary glass combination which forms the eyepiece. Uh, slide number 18 will show you a very simple diagram of a refractor telescope. So I would, uh, since we discussed this already, uh, we'll, we'll move on to slide 19, talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, this refractor system. So this, I would say uh, the refractor telescope, the biggest advantage is it's just uh, uh, buy it and forget it, use it and forget it. So you don't have to do any kind of maintenance on it. So it's very easy to use, robust and reliable. It's excellent for viewing uh, viewing closer objects and bigger objects like uh, the moon, uh, planets and binary stars, especially when you have a larger aperture. 
So uh, the the most significant uh, disadvantage of this is like the lens, the cost of the lens, and making the lens and maintaining it uh, over time uh, without scratches and smudges. So they are heavier; they easily break. So we don't need a uh, we don't need to deal with these things because these are pretty expensive too. Um, the other uh, disadvantage is uh, you 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 normally get something called an aberration in color uh, due to the refraction, light bending, and different amounts. So normally we um, for hobbyists this kind of uh, telescope is okay, but uh, as your application becomes complex, uh, people tend to avoid refractor telescopes. So next slide. 20 uh, exactly talks about why uh, refractor telescopes are uh, not that great. Uh, so the problems they suffer are uh, uh, what I discussed in the last slide. Uh, big lenses are pretty hard to make. Uh, they get thinner near the edge, so they break easily. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, the, the aberration of colors I talked about. So all these things, in addition, it's also expensive. So that's the reason we uh, the practical applications, uh, research applications shy away from refractive, refracting telescopes. So what do we have now? We have something called reflective telescopes, which are far more economical. Uh, they require some degree of maintenance, but uh, but again, uh, um, the image quality more than uh, makes up for that. So instead of using a lens in this case, what we do is uh, uh, we use a mirror to gather light. Uh, we have two mirrors uh, in a reflecting telescope, a primary mirror and a secondary mirror. A primary mirror is usually a parabolic mirror that focuses the light onto a single point, and then uh, that image is projected onto the secondary mirror, and that image comes to the eyepiece. So that's the difference between a refractor telescope and a reflector telescope. And uh, this solution was actually... Uh, invented by no other than the great Isaac Newton. So he actually thought refracting telescopes were uh, were not fit for uh, the applications that he was actually working for. And uh, and he wanted something which uh, which is a lot more easier to handle. So in that case, uh, that's how refractor uh, reflector telescopes were born. So synonymously, it was also called Newtonian telescopes. You can uh, if you say Newtonian telescopes, it's a reflector. So next slide. Advantages. Uh, the biggest advantage is the cost. Uh, mirrors are so easy to make uh, when compared to lenses because you have to work like it's uh, it's OK to work on only on one surface to polish one surface and you can you can leave the other surface uh, behind uh, behind the uh, ceiling or uh, or say the cover. Mm, they're reasonably compact as well. Uh, the focal length up to 900 milli, uh, I mean 900 millimeters is my telescope, but 1000 is pretty common too. Um, good field of view, good field of view. You can uh, actually view the deep sky objects uh, such as remote galaxies, nebula, star clusters, uh, much more, more, more efficiently than a refractor. Uh, it's reasonably good for uh, uh, lunar and planetary work too. And uh, the, uh, and the optical aberrations are non-existent in uh, Newtonian um, because uh, the phenomenon we use here is uh, reflection, not refraction. However, I actually, uh, when you talk of disadvantages, if you see you have uh, some kind of maintenance, you have to collimate it, make sure the the uh, image forms right at the center of the mirror. Otherwise, your spears are going to look like parabolas and uh, heads of comets, elliptical, we don't want to get there. So we want the image to be perfectly aligned. Uh, so the alignment between the primary mirror and the secondary mirror is very important. So that's called collimation, something like calibration, but uh, for telescopes, I would say calibration for telescopes. So Jeff, you have a question or comment? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out about optical aberrations. The reason that refractors have them is because the light is passing through a certain amount of glass, it's actually passing through the uh, being reflected by it. 
So different wavelengths are going to be bent different amounts, and that leads to an aberrant image. The reason that reflectors don't exhibit it is because you're not passing through much glass at all. Correct. You're so the phenomenon we use here is reflection and not refraction. So that is the thing. So we don't have a refractive index to deal with. Right, but it's not even passing through any glass to be refracted even by sure, accident. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Also, because we are using a mirror, uh, it can be manufactured uh, in a larger quantity uh, easily for uh, a lesser cost. So that's your, if your cost is your factor, then definitely consider a reflector over a refractor. What I use uh, here is uh, my home telescope is uh, about 4.5 inches in aperture and it does a pretty good job of capturing uh, images of planets and uh, very well uh, the moon too. So, but if you have larger apertures, say eight inches or over, you're going to actually get very, very good images. But the flip side to it is you can keep increasing the diameter, but then your portability becomes an issue. So if you want to move it around, I would say stick to somewhere around five inches or six inches. Next slide, uh, 23. So, um, this is talking about the different type of uh, reflecting telescopes. Uh, the most common one is the one in the center, uh, Newtonian focus, where you have the objective right in the somewhere in between the top and the bottom. Um, we have the Cassegrain as well. Uh, I'll talk about Cassegrain in the next slide. And uh, the other one is uh, called uh, Seud. I have not used Seud, so I don't know much about it, to be honest. Um, the Cassegrain um, arrangement is, is a combination. So that works really well. You, we use both lenses and mirrors here um, in this type of telescope. But uh, again, uh, these are pretty good, but it's going to push the cost factor like uh, uh, much higher than a reflector. So uh, I haven't used this kind of telescope so far, but I've, I've been told the image quality versus the portability, this is the best sweet spot. Uh, again, uh, again, the applications for this are uh, are different. We need uh, we need tracking mechanisms um, that are controlled by a computer, and uh, the mount is going to get a little bit complicated for Cassegrain's. Um, so, because of the complexity and cost, uh, I thought I will not dwell too much on this type of uh, telescope. However, the image quality is going to be good. Um, when we talk about famous telescopes, they are mounted in observatories. So you have uh, the Keck telescope and the Kitt Peak Observatory. There's one here uh, in our Bay Area to the Lick Observatory. So uh, that's also an optical telescope. Possibly Richard can throw uh, some more uh, uh, information on the Lick Observatory and whether he can arrange a visit in the future. Um, I know that Group 2 uh, Aerospace Education was trying to organize something last year uh, for both seniors and cadets, but um, for whatever reason, it did not pan out. Mm. Sure, if you can work out that, probably when all these COVID things are over, uh, uh, that'll be a great initiative as well for CEP. I looked their website, says they give tours once an hour all day long. Yeah, so basically just anybody can show up. Sure. I've, so never, I've never gone. I've always wanted to. So I checked their website, but never been there. But that's what it said. OK, so moving on, uh, all these telescopes we discussed are uh, Earth based telescopes, which means we are we are you we are we are placing the telescope somewhere over the land and uh, making our observations. There, there are some disadvantages to this because we have to deal with the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere uh, in the horizon, it's like it's the thickest. So if you're viewing uh, somewhere in the horizon, uh, then your image quality is going to take a hit. So normally we try to view objects when uh, when they are right on top of us. And uh, somewhere like at least 60 degrees from the horizon. So you don't have to deal with the atmosphere and the density of air and other objects in the air. 
So that's the main problem with Earth-based telescopes. You can't use it all the time. Of course, the weather comes into play as well. So if you are going to view uh, something, uh, an object, you have to also fight light pollution. If you're there in a city environment or uh, or place that's heavily lit, you're not going to make very uh, uh, significant progress in your observation. So what are the what, uh, alternatives to this? So one alternative is um, if you're very serious about your work, then probably you can use a, um, use NASA solution of putting it in space, uh, say Hubble telescope. So now we can loft telescopes into space, carry it as a payload uh, above the sea, um, and uh, we can uh, we can visit other worlds as well because we place it in other uh, uh, in outside our atmosphere. We don't have to actually fight distortions. Uh, so the Hubble is actually been providing us a lot of images. Uh, that are crystal clear and uh, uh, and giving a lot more detail. So, Kalash, before we start moving into um, you know, moving beyond here, uh, Aaron has a question. Sure. Oh yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, is... I'm able to hear you. Okay, I wasn't sure which microphone I'm using. So, uh, I did go on a tour of the Lick Observatory with my. Um, a mentor several years back and because he has a, a contact over there and it was during the nighttime so we went and used one of the observatories and uh, went around to some different stars and that was nice mm -hmm. and as far as like light pollution and so on I did hear there is just an overall ordinance in San Jose as far as the amount of light and the color tone of lights to really kind of uh, manage that as best as they can. Yes, yeah, so it's actually yeah. So speak, I was actually making a comment about that earlier with regards to filters. So yeah, if you most of the places in San Jose, you have the yellow orange lamps, which are sodium vapor lamps, because they have a very specific wavelength uh, wavelength of light, which can be filtered out. But as you know, as new developments like around mine up here um, on Communications Hill, they're actually sorry, my cat just changed slides. Um, <laughs> up here on Communications Hill, stop it. Um, we're actually switching back to uh, quote unquote white lights because they're using the LEDs, but again, they're still relatively uh, well maintained uh, color spectrums that can be filtered. And also, the LEDs have a general habit of casting, uh, creating less light pollution for the amount of light they produce, like in terms of illuminating an area. Well, lights also has to have to be specifically pointed downwards as well. Yes, whereas a lot of the sodium vapor lamps are kind of uh, lights on a pole which radiate everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Agree with that. And uh, my only point is try to get to an altitude where there is less light and your image quality is that much more better. Yeah, but at least in San Jose, we got air up in space. We don't. Yeah. yeah. So um, Hubble has been serving us with fantastic images uh, in, the, in, in the past. So now we are, we are waiting for the James Webb uh, Space Telescope to actually get launched. That is like uh, one of the I mean, when it gets into operation mode, I, I would say it will it will change uh, astronomy for sure. It's going to view uh, other galaxies and exoplanets and black holes. It's kind of uh, uh, capable of viewing uh, light and uh, say not just visible light, a lot more electromagnetic radiation over the entire spectrum. I mean, uh, it can view uh, some other um, rays such as infrared or UV also. So uh, we are going to get a lot more information in the future when the James Webb telescope actually launches. That's the next best thing, um, big thing that NASA is doing to put uh, a telescope in space. But right now Hubble is doing a wonderful job. So uh, next slide, 28. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is uh, we make a lot of observations in uh, the visible region, but not everything is visible. So if you want uh, to observe certain phenomenon, uh, you have to make sure that you are able to uh, view it in other uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. This starts right from uh, right from your radio waves all the way to gamma rays. So many uh, modern uh, telescopes do not use visible light, as I told you. Um, 
So in the year 1800, uh, William Herschel discovered infrared light, a kind of light that is not, not visible to us. In the time uh, since we have learned a lot more about telescopes and uh, light. So now we are having telescopes capable of uh, operating in the radio region, microwave, uh, the ultraviolet region, uh, X-rays and gamma rays. Astronomical objects can be observed in uh, all these flavors. Uh, if we have telescopes that are designed to detect these flavors of light. So normally if you take a optical telescope, radio waves pass right around them. Uh, we don't even uh, see any effect. And uh, the same is true uh, for X-rays and gamma rays as well. So you cannot actually uh, have any effect. So moving on to the next slide. So these are two specific orbiters uh, that have been spent into space. One is a gamma ray observatory. Uh, it's called Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. And then the other is an X-ray observatory. Uh, it's called Chandra X-ray Observatory. So um, there are uh, features. Uh, uh, if you see stars, they emit light uh, or electromagnetic radiation in different wavelengths. So uh, to, to actually study certain aspects of the stars, uh, their life cycle, uh, where they are, like how many, uh, uh, is it like close to the end or is it just being born? So the life cycle of a star can be better tracked by these, uh, these observatories. Um, less but equally effective solution is not getting into space at all. So uh, in my previous uh, AE talk, I've talked about Sophia. Uh, this is slide number 30. Sophia is, uh, we are not getting into space, but we are getting high up in the air uh, using a Boeing 747 SP frame. Uh, and we have uh, the telescope actually installed on the airplane itself, uh, on the fuselage of the airplane. So if you see, there's a tiny door which opens up. And uh, this telescope is different because it's an infrared telescope. Um, basically, one of the things that I'm talking about research as recent as yesterday. So NASA has found uh, uh, water in the moon in very trace uh, um, quantities as of yesterday. So this is the news and Sophia actually found it. Using infrared uh, uh, telescopes and spectroscopy. So um, that is one of the applications. So the other application is uh, uh, Sophia was also was uh, instrumental in actually discovering the world's first molecule. It was uh, called helium hydride. So um, helium hydride never exists on Earth. It's the first first compound that was ever found. Um, and uh, the amount of helium hydride that is radiated out of a star is literally proportional to the age of the star. So uh, Sophia discovered that as well. So if you see the uh, telescope in Sophia, it's a 2.5 meter, 100 inch diameter telescope. So it's a huge aperture. And uh, it has a visible component as well as a infrared component, but it's uh, like the more prominent one is the infrared. Uh, it still reflects. We have a big reflector. What I'm trying to say is we use reflector in most of the applications. That's what I told you before refractors they the lenses are not capable of doing this so any application that are specific to say uh, cutting edge technology they they tend to go towards reflector that was my point uh, moving on to slide number 31 not just uh, um, infrared light we can even use uh, um, radio waves so we learned that we can use uh, giant metal dishes that can actually bend radio waves uh, and uh, uh, collect the uh, radio waves in a similar fashion to a Newtonian mirror telescope. So right now, uh, using these big dishes, we can actually uh, capture radio waves and analyze them as well. With radio waves, you, you have to construct an image. You're not going to get an image. You're going to literally construct an image out of the data that you gather. For example, uh, I have worked with uh, a program called Gavert, which is a radio telescope in uh, Apple Valley, California, uh, which is also a NASA project. So one of the things we do in Gavert is uh, to actually hunt for black holes. 
um, and try to get as much data where the black hole is there in, in our part of the galaxy or uh, outside our galaxy. So uh, we do a study on that. We also study Jupiter's uh, ammonia concentration in the atmosphere uh, based on the uh, flux changes. The By flux changes, I mean uh, changes in intensity of light. Um, so we see uh, the at we study the atmosphere of uh, Jupiter and verify that data with the Juno orbiter that's there and uh, that NASA put over uh, Jupiter. So we have a second set of data to compare what's happening in Jupiter's atmosphere. So that's a very exciting project. Um, actually, uh, this is something I can actually uh, actually contribute to CAP as well if uh, if the senior members or cadets uh, if they are interested. So you can actually I can take control of the telescope and then um, and then point it to uh, a certain region. You can actually see the telescope moving. Uh, they have a webcam. I I actually got trained on this and this was like an amazing experience. So this is for another session, but this is something that I can actually bring to the plate later. So I was hunting for black holes in the limited 30 minutes I had. Uh, next slide. Next slide is uh, slide number 32, uh, very large array. So with radio telescopes, it's possible uh, that we can use a bunch of uh, different uh, telescopes. I mean, in this case, dishes, and uh, we can produce a single result. So it's like uh, cascading a bunch of telescopes to produce and stitch one giant result out of it. So we have one in uh, New Mexico, and uh, this is uh, like pretty cutting edge uh, in terms of exploring the edges of the universe and uh, and the research that they are doing. So. Um, in a nutshell, this is my presentation, but uh, before we actually leave, I can show you my uh, telescope setup. So this is one of the uh, one of the eyepieces I have. This is a 25 mm eyepiece. I start with this all the time because it gives you the maximum field of view. Uh, and uh, it's pretty easy to view a large portion of uh, the sky with this. So I st always start off with the uh, lowest magnification and then progress. So all the way, uh, this is a 25 mm eyepiece. Uh, so if you want to see the magnification delivered by this, uh, you basically divide uh, 900, which is the uh, focal length of my telescope with with the eyepiece uh, focal length, which is 25 mm, and come up. So this is so I can use something called a Barlow lens, which actually uh, comes with the kit. And what the Barlow lens does is doubles the magnification. In my case, I have a 2x Barlow lens, so it basically doubles the magnification. So you use this one and this one in combination, you get a bigger image, a magnified image. But I wouldn't say it's the greatest image in the world just because it's big. You may lose some detail. That's why you have other eyepieces which are uh, which have a lower uh, focal length. Uh, this is a 10 mm eyepiece that I use. Uh, for uh, viewing uh, planets. For the moon, this is like, uh, if you want to view the craters of the moon or something in detail, a 10 mm would do uh, great. But if you want to view the uh, surface of the moon, I mean, you want to see the curvature, uh, you want to see the circular features of the moon, then I would recommend uh, uh, low magnification. You also have a 4 mm uh, lens like this, uh, which I don't use a lot because your uh, telescope is going to get really, uh, uh, I mean, wobbly at that magnification because uh, you're fighting with the atmosphere, you're fighting with the wind and uh, other external conditions. So these are something I wanted to show you. And then what I do for uh, astrophotography is like, I keep it really simple. I have a mount that actually fits right on the eyepiece. So uh, one end holds my cell phone, the other end fits into the eyepiece. So uh, I can take basic imaging. So that's all. I, I, I don't have very specific cameras. There are special astrophotography cameras as well, which are with, with a high frame rate. So um, for the moon, you can actually take a photograph. That's more than enough. Um, for other planetary objects, what I do is I, I don't take photographs. What I do is I capture videos. Um, but that way, you can use a technique called lucky imaging take the best image out of the frames. So 
uh, shoot a video at, uh, at, at the highest frame rate possible and you have software to actually um, place those image on top of each other and get a very uh, detailed image at the end. So that's what I do for planets. So that's a topic in itself. So if I start get started on that, like it's going to take another half an hour. So basically, uh, this is where I can end today. I will also show you my telescope. So this is a 4.5 inch, uh, 114 mm uh, telescope. It's not the greatest in terms of portability, but I can still manage it fits in the car, uh, on the rear seat or in the or in the trunk. Um, I have to collimate it though. If, I, if it's going through vibrations, then your alignment between the primary mirror and the secondary mirror are going to get disturbed at some point. So I have to collimate it and have a device for that. And uh, this is the top lid. I'm not sure whether it's visible. Okay, right now. So if you have, uh, depending on what aperture size you want, you can open the small guy or you can open the entire thing. So what you see inside here is, uh, if you see the reflecting object in the end is the primary mirror and then on the on the top side you have the secondary mirror and whatever you observe through the secondary mirror can be seen through the eyepiece that's the hole i'm showing you here and uh, what is this guy for you can ask this is called a spotter scope uh, this guy here so it's called a spotter scope i use it initially to focus the object uh, from from an eye level point of view this is more a you can call it a mini refractor refract telescope. So, it's good. so you have to align the primary mirror with what you observe on the spotting scope. The spotting spo uh, scope actually has a target in it. Some modern ones have laser targets as well, so where you can align it with the primary mirror. So that's about it. I mean, mine is not a very expensive setup, so it's kind of more than enough to get started. What we have in our uh, STEM uh, program is a similar telescope, which is like, which is, I would say, not as powerful as mine, but it does the job when it comes to basic planetary viewing and basic lunar viewing. So I think I'm looking forward to the time where we get the STEM kit. So yeah, that's an excellent, uh, excellent segue. So um, obviously, right before you know COVID nineteen you know, took us out. We had the flight simulator STEM kit we picked up from National. Uh, we got it set up in one of the computers in the squadron building along with um, the VR goggles. Mm -hmm. And um, I know the cadets had one uh, one day they got to play with the VR goggles and we were shut down, you know, by that, you know, before the following week. Uh, so obviously want to finish up with the STEM kit, the flight sim STEM kit, uh, do the required evaluation on it. But yeah, one of the ideas would be is to get the astronomy STEM kit um, mm -hmm. again, so we can have some fun potentially. You know, our seniors um, messing around some astronomy and potentially some photography, depending on how. Yeah, you know, even if it's bad, it's still fun, right? Yeah. Um, and then also engage the cadets as well um, in that. So that's kind of where I kind of foresee maybe the next year. Well. Post-COVID, post-COVID activities for the uh, for the squadron. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, just that I have to manage my time a little bit more prudently, but I'll definitely love to do anything. Yeah. And Eric, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Kalesh, thank you. Amazing presentation. Very interesting. I, the question that I had is, you're just showing your own telescope, and you're restricting the the aperture. Is that back to the same point you made about brightness obstructing? Yes, exactly. So um, I'll tell you why we are reducing the size. So the inner door, if you imagine you have a full moon and you don't actually require all the 114 mm because you're going to collect a lot more light than you actually want. So you can use this little guy here and take, take a cut on the light. Got and, it. So you, yeah. you, you basically get brightness control or less brightness. Yeah at the expense of a reduced what field of view yeah mm -hmm. your field of view will reduce but uh, at the same time your light gathering ability will reduce so that your quality of the image is slightly going to increase but i would not use this if you ask me i will still use the 100% uh, open one and i use a filter 
Mm. That will give you better results than doing this one. Hey, hey, Kalash, in photography, if I reduce my light, mm -hmm. I get an increased field of view. Why is it in a telescope that's backwards? Uh, I didn't get your question. Can you can you repeat? Sure. Uh, in photography, when I when I step myself down and reduce the aperture, reducing the light onto the film, uh -huh. my field of view becomes wider because the because the rays that are entering the camera are more aligned with each other, so the focus is, is wider. And I was wondering, you said that that's not true when you do it in a telescope. Can you tell us why? That is because you have a uh, you have you have two elements to deal with here. We have a uh, we have an eyepiece and we have a we have an uh, we have an objective. So what happens here is the image is getting flipped as well uh, by doing this. I I would think to answer your question, I think that is one of the reasons. But I'm not really sure on the physics part of it. I have to check. Oh, okay, thank you. Can I can I just make a few comments here? Please do, Jeff. Um. First of all, um, the Cassegrain scopes that are out on the market now are not much more expensive than any other types. Um, if you go into the Orion store, you can find the Schmidt Cassegrains for only slightly more than you find a standard reflector or refractor. And in fact, uh, they can be very good bang for the buck as far as aperture is concerned. Um, I agree, yes. I agree, but uh, yeah, just that it's not very popular among the amateur guys is what I I drove in the presentation. I do agree, they produce excellent results, no doubt well, about it. If somebody is looking to buy a scope and they want best bang for the buck, the best bang is actually probably a Dobsonian. Or would yeah, you exactly. not mention because it's a reflector based on the right. same principle as the other reflectors? But they tend to be made fairly inexpensively with cardboard tubes and right. things like that. And you can get eight or ten inches of aperture fairly cheap. Correct. So in terms exactly. of back for the buck, um, yeah. you get you get that with you don't have a fancy mount. Um, you can't mount it equatorial, for example. Right, right. Uh, so uh, what Jeff is telling is talking about is the mount. Uh, so we have to mount this telescope over something. Um, we uh, we have two type of mounts. The most common is called Dobsonian, uh, which uh, gives you control over the azimuth and the uh, sideways movement. Uh, the other type of mount I use is called Altas, which is also uh, very similar to a Dobsonian, but we have a tripod. The But uh, what astronomers usually use, experienced astronomers usually use, they have something called the equatorial mount. They track the movement of the planet in the same direction uh, as the uh, movement of the planet. So that is like for an for an amateur astronomer that's asking too much because there is a lot of setup before you can observe. You can uh, it's pretty complicated to use an equatorial mount. Equatorial mounts tend to be fairly expensive, also. Yeah. So I would uh, for somebody who's starting on uh, astronomy, I would not recommend equatorial mount. So random random thing that has popped into my head. Um, how expensive are like lenses? So for like for example, if we bought if we bought plastic, if we bought a couple plastic lenses of different sizes, could we take a paper towel roll, stick a lens at one end, stick another lens at the other end, and make a cheap refract you know, uh, refract telescope? You can. You can actually do it. People do it with the cardboard. Um, they do reflect. Well, no, because I was thinking it might be for, that might also be a fun activity for us, or you know, for us potentially to do with low cost, and also do with the cadets potentially is make our own telescopes, even though they're not that great, you know. Yeah. Or even a piece of PVC. Exactly. Yeah. PVC. And and be pirates for you know we can be pirates for a day or whatnot. Lean out of our airplanes with a telescope. You know? The greatest challenge though is going to be in aligning the two mirrors uh, or the objective, whatever you're planning to use. So in mirrors, you need a parabolic mirror, which is like different from the normal mirrors that are commercially available, the flat ones. They're not going to focus the light onto a single point. So you just have to get that from somewhere. So you have to go to an Orion store or something to get that. So once you have those in place and you have some kind of a pipe, you can actually try doing that. I know there's a bunch of videos on the internet on exactly how to achieve that, but I would leave uh, telescope manufacturers to do the uh, do the things for us because like it's a pretty complicated 
world out there. It's yeah, it's yeah. pretty hard even to view objects with uh, electron. Uh, I mean, electron telescopes. Forget about DIY stuff. I don't know whether uh, it's. I mean, it's definitely possible, but I don't know the time that you're going to invest doing it. Yeah, it's just 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 a thought of just a thought of something to do, even if even if it's you know not a very good one. Just kind of like looking across the field and whatnot. Yeah. So. And talking about lenses, we have uh, two types. This is called a Plosel. Plosel is like plastic lenses. They are like pretty uh, entry level. See, for fifty bucks, I think I bought a whole range, starting from twenty five mm right down to four mm. So I think that for for that. Uh, price point, I think it's a pretty good value for money. But if you want greater eye relief and uh, if you're using it for some particular application, then I would recommend uh, lenses that are like much more uh, customizable in terms of zoom, uh, zoom adjustment and stuff. You have you have uh, lenses that are costlier than my telescope, so. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like the classic, right? Everyone who buys a camera, the camera body is the cheap thing. It's the camera lenses yeah. that always cost exactly. money. Exactly. Same story. The same story. Yeah, Bill Winter. Yeah. Real quick, what should you absolutely stay away from? Stay away from any telescope that advertises the magnification on the box. So yeah, uh, another thing I forgot to tell you. If somebody tells you uh, my telescope has got a lot of magnification, please go ahead and buy it. That's possibly the most stupid marketing statement they can ever make. So don't buy a telescope based on the claim that magnification is 100x, 200x, 800x, 700x. It does Absolutely. not matter. Absolutely right. You buy it based on aperture, not on magnification. Exactly. So there's no use of having a 700x when your telescope cannot handle it. You're not going to get anything. You can get any magnification you want out of any telescope, provided you're willing to settle for no resolution. Yeah, exactly. Aaron. It's like 8K recording on a phone or uh, how many megapixels on a really good camera. Exactly. So beyond, uh, say, uh, beyond 15 megapixel or uh, 20 megapixel, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to view the pixel at that range, right? They say there are three important measurements when you're buying a telescope. They're called aperture, aperture, and aperture. Exactly. I agree. What, was that an aperture with an A? Yes. yes. Was it capital or lowercase? Capital. You can spell it however you like. Yeah, I but think... make sure you get the and between them correctly. <laughs> Don't put an opera sign. Roger that. Uh, I've got a weird story regarding ampersands, but that's uh, neither here nor there right now. Um, well, Kalash, I don't know if you've been following the chat, um, apart from random conversations about cats, which of course interrupt every single meeting. Um, <laughs> the the prevailing comments have been, um, you know, talking about the presentation about how everyone seems to be enjoying it. Um, I know different people have been having different levels of connection, so they, you know, so I just want to pass that along if you're not reading the chat. Uh, so definitely, thank you very much for um, for that. Apparently, Bill Winter has just invited you to speak for Squadron 36 AE, so you can connect with him through email. I'm sure you can arrange sure, that. Sure. Um, that would be that would be excellent. It's always good to do the outreach um, when we have the expertise to do so, and this is mm -hmm. definitely a fun topic. Uh, 